2 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we're going to be tonight. Uh, the Lord had us diverge out of uh, our verse-by-verse -verse study last week, and we looked at, uh, towards the end of 2 Corinthians, and we looked at that word reprobate, and we examined that a little deeper, uh, just brought some things to light about it, uh, you know, having that, that inner witness of God in you, and you know that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And uh, you either know he's in you, or you're a reprobate. That's, that's what that amounted to. Um, but as, as Paul is writing here in, in 2 Corinthians, uh, the conversation that he's having is, is it, it goes in and out of exhortation, and uh, there isn't as much correction in this. There was much rebuke in 1 Corinthians. There's a lot more deep doctrinal things that he is touching on. This is a lot deeper of a, of a letter than what his first one was. When he first wrote to uh, the, the Corinthian church, there was a lot of, of uh, things that needed to be corrected. There was a lot of things that were amiss. There was a lot of things that uh, were, were not right. Paul's writing, and he's getting into more deep doctrinal things. Uh, he, he hits on this thing of repentance. And the last time we were in uh, 2 Corinthians, in, in chapter 7 here, we, we really hit on a few of these things. We went right through uh, verse 1 all the way to verse 10. And I'm not going to rehash all of that. But just to bring us up to speed, we're going to start at verse 6 and read through verse 10. And then we're going to pick up again at verse 11. And this is where we'll continue on from. Um, but before I, before I do, Brother Trent, would you want to... Oh, ask the Lord's blessing on the time of preaching. Lord God, thank you uh, for this time we have to gather together. Father, I pray for your, uh, that your spirit, Father, would have its way. Father, open our minds to your word, Father. Uh, Father, this came dangerous. Let us uh, go back to our homes tonight, Father, have been spoken to by your spirit mm -hmm. through the word of God. Father, be with the past. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. It says, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. And of course, you, you know the type of letter that he wrote. You know how he spoke with them the last time. It was a very harsh rebuke because a very harsh rebuke was needed. And he was comforted by the coming of Titus because Titus had spent some time in the church there at Corinth. And what Titus reported was they not only helped Titus, but Titus was uh, exhorted by them and was built up and edified by them because of their fervent heart for Paul. I think about a harsh rebuke that, that the pastor might have to bring upon the people and to correct some things. We've done that from time to time. And to have a few men of God come up afterwards and say, Pastor, thank you for that. We needed that. And, and those types, it's very precious to the man of God. Okay, now I'm not begging that for my own self, but just so you're aware. Um, and this is what kind of was happening here. Titus reported, listen, they've gotten it figured out. They grabbed hold of it. They, they got a hold of the truth. What the Word of God did in them was effectual. And we're going to see a, a little bit of that as we continue on here. Uh, let's see, verse 8. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. Right? So there, there was sorrow in his heart as he was doing that. As he was writing this thing, there was sorrow in his heart for the church at Corinth because he loved those people. And he knew what this type of harsh rebuke would do to them. Uh, thinking of especially this one who was, who was given over to the flesh uh, or given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Uh, how, how all of that transpired, uh, it, it, that is a very difficult thing for a man of God who has a love for the people. And when you continue on reading here, it says this, For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. 
he knew what had happened in their hearts. He knew what it had done. And he says, now though, verse 9, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. All right, that is the whole key. If anything ever harsh or painful comes from my lips, please know and understand it's from my heart and I desire for you to sorrow, but to sorrow to repentance. If there's something in our lives that God has revealed to us that we need to address and that needs to be brought out and needs to be um, um, confronted and changed, well, that, that godly sorrow, it says here, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. The damage wasn't from Paul. The damage wasn't from the apostles. The damage wasn't from physical lips. The damage was from God. But it worked a godly sorrow to repentance. Uh, verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. All right? This is the type of thing, and I've, I've heard people talk about it. I've never spoken with anyone personally who has had this mindset. But they've said that, uh, you know, I, I tried that for a while. I did it God's way. I followed him. Um, and I'm just, I'm completely done with God. I know some people that are living that, but to have those words come out of their mouth, I've never heard it. But I've heard of other people talk of that. This person grew up in church. They made a profession as a child and they, they continued on in their life, but things just fell apart for them and they've just completely turned their back on God and they want nothing to do with God and they've just completely denounced this great God of heaven. That person was never saved in the first place. That person never came to repentance, not from a godly sorrow. Uh, Judas repented. He tried to take the money back, but that was a worldly sorrow because you look at how it ended up. He died. That worked death in him. Okay? Godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. Okay. That is eternal, everlasting life. That life that we looked at this morning, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the faith of Jesus Christ being given to a, a repentant sinner who believes that is salvation not to be repented of. When somebody receives a true salvation from the hand of God, when that is wrought in them, they are passed from death unto life. That is a salvation that you cannot repent from even if you wanted to. Because look further on there in John, we didn't, we didn't cover it, but uh, he says that, um, well, I'll turn to it and read it offhand. Uh, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is uh, John 10, 28. Verse 29 says, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And so this, this great assurance that we have, that comes from, salvation is its own assurance. When somebody comes to you and they say, yeah, I, I, I've, I've been born again, you don't need to take the word of God and say, okay, now, now here is a, a verse that proves to you that and proves that to you and proves that to you and proves that. No, they have the inner witness of the Spirit of God, bearing witness with their spirit that they are a child of God now. Okay. Remember, that works two ways. He bears witness to that spirit. He bears witness with that spirit. All right? So his spirit is witnessing. And that witness, remember, it is a declaration with proof. Okay? So he's bearing witness with your spirit. You remember, your spirit is what controls your thinking. It's what drives your thinking. It's, it's what makes you think one way or think another way or however it may act. And God's Spirit will bear witness with your spirit because your thinking will change. Your thought processes will change. The way that you think changes. And your spirit choosing those things rather than choosing the carnal things of this world, that is an inner witness of the Spirit of God with you that you are a child of God. You no longer have to fight to think of spiritual things. That stuff comes naturally to you. Uh, as we, at, at our missions conference, we had our, our uh, 
our, our visitor friend here, and he sat, I think it was three rows back, and, and he, he gave testimony that night when he was here. And he said that when, when Christ is in you, and I'm paraphrasing his words, but if those of you who were here remember, when Christ is in you, you can't even sin right anymore. You just, you just can't, you can't do the things you used to do. You, you can't talk the way you used to talk. You can't live the way you used to live. God changes all of that. Rather than a, a king on the throne of your heart, it's now a thief in the corner, okay? Trying to work his way in. That's sin, all right? And so this is that, that salvation not to be repented of, that godly sorrow that worketh salvation, or worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. And again, remembering that that ETH denotes a continual action, okay? It continues on. It isn't just a one-time working, all right? That godly sorrow worketh repentance, all right? Um, uh, a great, a great uh, supporting statement for this, or a great supporting verse for this, the Word of God, uh, would be, um, he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Okay? And the reason some of you have not ceased from sin is because you have not yet suffered in the flesh. But when you suffer in that flesh, it works a godly sorrow to a godly repentance, to a godly salvation not to be repented of. All right? And so this is, this is where we all kind of left off last week. Uh, verse 11 now picks up. Uh, yeah, I had written in there Judas Iscariot. Ahab is in the much same way because Ahab repented, okay? Uh, but his life ended in sorrow and death. So that again, you want to judge this repentance. Yeah, Brother Mike. Saul. Saul. Saul the same way. Yep, absolutely. You, you go through the Bible and you see these different ones that supposedly have repented, okay? Or it even says that they have repented. And you weigh it with this verse. Remember, rightly dividing the word of truth. The way you rightly divide the word of God is with the law of God. Okay? And in relation to this, you look at that in all throughout the word of God, and you find these different places where people have repented. What did that repentance result in? Did they go and kill themselves? Did they go and die? Did they turn back and live a wicked life and end up being killed because of it? Or was it something that wrought true change in their life? That wrought something different? Look at Peter. Was his a, salva a, 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 a worldly sorrow or a godly sorrow when he was converted? Okay. You remember when Jesus told him, um, uh, I can't remember the first part of the verse, but he, he, at the end of it, he says, uh, and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren. And you see him doing that. You see him doing that continually. That was kind of the closing statement of when we had finished our Thursday night Bible study on 1 Peter, when we closed out 1 Peter. That was the statement that, that came to mind as we were looking at this. Peter is still doing just that. He is strengthening, strengthening his brethren with his word that is carried on and continued. Then you look into 2 Peter, and he continually is going on with that. And that whole first chapter of 2 Peter is God's proof and God's statement that he always intended to give us a perfect Bible, right from the very beginning. That's, that's always been his thing. And like we were talking about this morning, this fellow that's talking about that God gave his word imperfectly on purpose, that is straight from the pit of hell. All right? It was in a, a Bible magazine that we get delivered to the church here, all right? Logos Bible software and the wickedness behind all of that. Doubting the Word of God, that spirit of error in the world today. You know, making us think that there's error in the Word of God, or that God intentionally gave us that error for debate. It gets our blood hot, I tell you. I t there's two ladies sitting on this side that I would not want to cross on the other side of the Bible debate. I'm just saying. Okay. What are we doing? Verse 11. Okay. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Okay? So he, he's commending them for this. I beheld this selfsame thing. 
ye got sorrowed after a godly sort. And then he continues on. He says, what carefulness it wrought in you. These are, these are fruits meet for repentance. Okay? These are the fruits of lives that have lived a true repentance. A life that was once one way and is now a completely other. All right? It wrought carefulness in them. Okay? Instead of living a flippant life, now all of a sudden they were careful. Now, Paul says, be careful in nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. However, it's not the same carefulness that he's talking about here. Okay? This is, this is another way, another good Bible word you could, you could link in here would be circumspect. Okay? They're, they're now walking circumspect. They're walking carefully. They, they, they would walk just flippantly and just do whatever, and there were things that they would allow to happen in their lives, and it just didn't bother them. But what happened is that godly sorrow wrought carefulness in them. Okay? Think about, and, and I love that word wrought. I love the, the, the idea of salvation being wrought in a life. I love the idea of, of carefulness being wrought in a life because of godly sorrow that worked repentance to salvation. I love that. And I've got to wonder, how many of those people in that Corinthian church were born again because they were finally broken from his first letter? So he said, godly sorrow worketh for repentance unto salvation. And he says, look at the th same thing it wrought in you all. Look what it did. So let's, get, let's keep going here. It says, yea, what clearing of yourselves. Oh, see, that's a good thing. You know, James writes, and, and we love the last part of this verse, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay. Uh, I prayed uh, for Kyle, for his hunt. When, as soon as I found out he had, was going out hunting the other day, and I needed to call him for something, and uh, I don't even remember what day it was, but I called him, and and, uh, or I, I sent him a text and, uh, we chatted back and forth a little bit. He was hunting at the time, so I didn't want to keep him. But as I'm, as I'm texting, I told him, Hey, I'm praying for your hunt. And then he sends me a picture of a dead deer on the ground. And he says, well, the fervent effectual prayer. <laughs> I said, Hey, hey, man, that's good. All right. But we love the end of that verse, but we don't like the beginning part. You know what the beginning part of that is? Confess your faults one to another. Pray for another, that you may be healed. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A lot of people that very well may be forgiven, but you're harboring bitterness, and you need healing. You don't confess your sins. Okay? That's for God. That's 1 John 1, 9. You confess that to God. You don't confess your sins to me. But if you've done something and you know it's a fault against me or against your neighbor or against your wife, against your children, yes, parents, it's good to apologize to your children. Amen to that. It doesn't matter how old you are. But confessing your faults is going to that one and saying, I did this, and I was wrong. This is my fault. Okay. I wrought this in our lives. I'm the one that did this. It was me, and I was wrong. And then you pray for one another, and that brings healing. Do you know why that brings healing? Is because all of a sudden there's nothing between you and that person anymore. And you know how freeing that is. If you've ever had that type of thing, you know how freeing it is to let things go. Nigh is a very precious thing. Nothing between. Nothing between. Just nigh. I'd love to show you what nigh is, but you've seen it so many times. I just like hugging my wife. But, all right. Well, careful and it rod in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Oh, it's kind of shifts here, huh? Yea, what fear, what vehement desire. Yeah, that vehemence, it shows a passion. It shows an intensity. That, that vehement desire, that indignation. 
oh, a righteous indignation, that, that holy hatred for sin. Rather than welcoming it, it all of a sudden is, is a putrescence to you. And it's just, ah, oh, it's vile. And there's just, there's nothing more that you want than to cut that right out of your life. Even so much as to gouging out your eyes and casting it from you. Or cutting off your hand that offends you and casting it from you. I, I'm not saying to go home and mutilate yourself. But what I am saying is, it would be worth it. You don't think so? What did Jesus say? It'd be better for you to go into eternal life halt and maimed than to hang on to that stuff and let it drive you to hellfire. And you don't think that there's a, 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 a seeking after God and a coming up out of Egypt first when Jesus said that? There's scales over your eyes, friends. Some of you are lost in here tonight and you have scales over your eyes because you refuse to stop looking at certain things. You have scales over your heart because you refuse to stop, stop listening to certain music and listening to certain people. And it'd be better for you to go into eternal life deaf than to let that one thing keep you from believing. Not my words, that's Jesus. And I'll amen that because nobody else is. I heard a couple. I, I'm not... I'm not trying to be ugly. But we're so good at faking church. And there's a disconnect between what we read and what we amen and what we see and what we say and hear and, and what we actually live. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's like what we looked at this morning. Pharisees. We've got it right on the outside. Boy, and that'll blind us. What indignation, yea, what fear... What vehement desire, what zeal. You know, zeal doesn't come up very often in the Word of God. I've never studied it out fully to see how many times the word zeal is, but in the times that I can remember it, it's either talking about Paul or it's talking about Jesus. And his zeal hath eaten him up. When was the last time you had zeal for anything? You see lots of zeal come around, you know, the time of the Super Bowl and a lot of zeal when it comes time for, uh, you know, the World Series. A lot of zeal when it comes to hunting season. A lot of zeal when it comes to uh, following the God of Mammon. A lot of zeal in those types of things. But where's our zeal for God? Paul, Saul the Pharisee, had so much zeal concerning zeal persecuting the church. And there was no one that was more zealous about it than he was. Remember, he said he is the chief of sinners. And that zeal that he was living out when he was born again, you know what happened? God didn't take that, take that zeal from him. God changed that zeal from persecuting and destroying the church to preaching and exhorting the church and edifying the church. It was that same zeal. And that's that zeal that we saw all throughout 1 Corinthians as we studied through the thing. And now we see the fruit of that zeal being replicated in them. One thing about zeal is it's like fire. Fire with just the right amount of wind will spread really quickly. Okay? It, and the funny thing is, you don't need to advertise a fire. Okay? I remember a year, and it was cold, so it must have been in the middle of winter, probably January, we'll just say this. And uh, the pharmacy down in downtown Elkland uh, burned. The whole building of it burned. 
And I remember seeing the glow from up on top of the hill where we lived. You could see the town of Elkland. You could see the glow in the middle of town. And we got in the car and we drove down there to see what was burning. And of course there's fire trucks and they've got the whole main street park blocked off and uh, they're, they're spraying water on the thing and there's ice all over the, the buildings around where it's over spraying and everything, very cold night. But there were tons of people out. I'd say pretty near the whole town of Elkland was there to watch Buchanan's Pharmacy burn. And you don't need to advertise a fire. There was a preacher and uh, he, was, he was a slave. And after the, the Emancipation Proclamation, he was freed. And he was completely ignorant. He couldn't read, couldn't write. He went to this church and, and uh, he didn't have any work, but he wanted to work. And so he offered to that church, he offered to the pastor, if you let me stay here, and if you teach me how to read and write, I will take care of your church and I'll take care of the grounds and I'll clean it and I'll maintain it and I'll do all of this. All right, so they made that agreement. And so this man learned to read and to write from the King James Bible. And as he learned all of this, he got saved. Okay? Just, through, just through learning to read and write from the Word of God, he was born again. Well, it was years later, and that pastor originally that was there had passed away and died. And the people said, we want you to be our pastor to this ex-slave. So he's there, and he's preaching in this church. And it's in a small area, small community. It's, it's way down south in, um, I think it was North Carolina. And people would come all the way from Charlotte. People would come from the big cities up out to hear this man preach. And it was so much so that there was a reporter from one of those big cities down there that came out and just to, just to see what was going on. Why are people coming from so far just to hear this guy preach? And after he heard him preach, he's like, wow, this is, what, is, what is it about this guy? So later he, he went up to him and he said, you know, I'm, I'm from this you know, publication. And I, what is, why are so many people coming out here? And what he said was they've, that they, they've heard that the preacher was on fire. They just wanted to come and watch him burn. They wanted what that man had. And they would come for miles to get it. It doesn't happen today. Again, why? Why don't people knock on our door asking for what we have. Why don't people look at our families and say, that's what I want? Maybe it's our lack of zeal. For the Corinthian church, there was proof there that that had been wrought in them, that zeal. And sure enough, it was going to spread like wildfire. Verse 11 continues, Yea, what revenge? What revenge? Chapter 2, verse 6 says this. Uh, oh, sorry, 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I might not overcharge you. Sufficient to a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Now, I believe this is talking about that one that was involved in fornication, that fornication so much so that the, uh, the Gentiles didn't even have a name for it. It wasn't... It, was, it wasn't named among the Gentiles. It was just a regular way of life. It wasn't considered wicked. It wasn't considered anything. But it was fornication, not adultery. So we know that that, that man's father was dead. Okay? If that man's father was still alive, it would have been adultery. Okay? But what God considers, considered and considers uh, clearly still today, what he considers an absolute abomination before him is for a man and his sons to go into the same woman. Absolute wickedness. But that wasn't named as a sin among Gentiles. Okay, that's what that's stating. And when God, through Paul, confronted the church with that, we see that there was great revenge wrought on this man. Okay, this was wrought on him. 
And they, he mentions that in, in chapter 2. He says, in all things, this is uh, chapter 7, verse 11 again, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You've approved yourselves. You've got ample proof to show that you are clear in this thing. You dealt with it when it was brought to your attention. Some of them may have been ignorant to it. Again, it's not named among the Gentiles. Didn't know that was wrong. But just like you go through the book of Leviticus and you see there uh, chapter uh, four and on there, where it talks about the sins of ignorance uh, for a, a ruler, for a priest, for the common people, for a nation, okay, all of these. Once a thing is learned, you're no longer ignorant of it, and God requires something of you. Okay, that's why Paul brought that to the Jews' attention when he's preaching in Acts chapter 3, and he says that, I want that you did it out of ignorance. You were ignorant of this thing, but now you know. There's no more excuse. God only gave him a couple more chances of that, and then he closed the door. But let's continue here. It says in verse 12, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong. How about that? He wasn't doing it for that one. He wasn't doing it for that man. He didn't write to them so that that man would be corrected and, and would be punished and would be beaten and thrown out of the church and whatever else may have happened to him. It wasn't the purpose of it. I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He wanted to show them how much he loved them. That's why he rebuked them. That's why he brought that harsh rebuke, because what was going on was hurting them. Fornication is a sin against your own body. Period. Adultery is the only sin that's named as being a sin against your own soul. Okay? You don't think God holds that thing in very high special regard. It's the only thing that's a sin against your own body and the only thing that's a sin against your own soul. It's damaging. It's hurtful. And again, I'll define it for you. It's any sexual act without that marriage covenant. Alone, with somebody, doesn't matter. Jesus Christ makes that clear when he says in Matthew chapter 5 that you've already committed adultery in your heart if you even look on a woman to lust after her. So why would that not apply to fornication as well? Okay. And remember, entire people groups were wiped out for that. And I've said it before, how many of us in this room would still be standing here if God wrought immediate judgment on all the fornicators right now. Killed us. How many people would be still alive in Shingle House? Sadly, very few. But all of this was so that his care for them in the sight of God, not necessarily even in their sight, but in the sight of God, might appear unto you. Okay. God could see his love for them. God could see how, what he desired for them. And God, uh, he says very plainly before that, and I have the mind of Christ. Okay. So Paul's mind is Christ's mind. And, and that mind of Christ is, is something that God will give you. That spirit of life in Christ Jesus, his spirit directing your spirit, directing your mind, directing your thinking so that your mind operates and works the same way that Jesus Christ does. That's what Paul desired for the Corinthian church. It's what I desire for our church. It's what I desire for our children. is for them to hear these hard things that is completely opposite to what they hear six hours every single day when they're in school. Exact opposite. Christian school, public school, doesn't matter. It's all full of wickedness. We could give personal testimony to that. And so let's continue here. We're almost done. Verse 13. 
Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. You know, this is a, this is a very precious thing. It's a great testimony for the character of Titus, that Paul is looking at Titus as one that would be a barometer for the spiritual well-being of a church, just for how he came from them. All right, this is why I stress, and whenever we have preachers in, whenever we have missionaries that come through and stay with us, I want to be like Anesiphorus. I want them to leave here more refreshed than when they came, Amen. not more exhausted. And that's not anything that we can do. I mean, we've got facilities here that God has allowed us to have that, that help facilitate that some, but if we had a barn with a bunch of hay, we could make them just as comfortable. Is that room next door? If our spirit was in it. But he was refreshed uh, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. How about that? What Paul described in the church, Titus saw. It was the truth. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. What a refreshing statement that is to be able to say for Paul. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things." This is a shift for Paul. This is a, a, a closing of a matter. This is a full reconciliation of what had taken place. The fruits of repentance are there. All of this is showing that they grabbed hold of the word of God and they ran with the Lord with it. And they weren't going to look back. What a blessing to be able to say. I've seen that raw in some lives. Very few, but some. As, as you look at, at the life of a one who, who is living in error, who is living according to that spirit of error, that spirit of Antichrist, which now worketh, praise the Lord, he that letteth will let. That's God's will to hold back that spirit of Antichrist so that lost sinners can seek the Lord. And praise the Lord for that. And, and when salvation is wrought in them, or when the saint of God is corrected on something and they receive it with joy, you know that they have dropped their pride. We don't want to receive correction because we don't want to be told we're wrong. Because every single soul in here is foolish, childish, and proud. But if the Lord would hide our pride from us, as we prayed this morning, if the Lord would hide our pride from us so that we could see ourselves, so that when the word of God is preached and the secrets of our heart are made manifest, we could acknowledge that before a holy God and say, yes, that is me. And that very well may be one more thing moved out of the way. One more thing moved out of the way. Uh, Brother Tim McVeigh talks about the, the year that he got saved. He said, I, I was in repentance for six months. He says, I was actively repenting for six months before he was actually saved. That his life had gotten to the point where he was turning everything out of the way. He, he was getting rid of that and getting rid of that. God was pointing his finger at that. He'd get rid of it. God pointed his finger at that, moved it out of his life. He quit that. He stopped that. Now, the day he got saved, he had been to church and he had a dip of snuff in his mouth the entire time. Okay? When God says it's over, it's over. All right? I don't expect a lost person to act like a Christian. In fact, it scares me when they do. Because they're never going to see themselves as lost. But when God finally arrested his attention and got a hold of his heart and showed him 
what he was in front of a holy and an almighty God. It just, just that quick. But he says, I, I, I was repenting for six months. You've heard him preach. You know how he has those inflections. But these fruits meet for repentance. This is the stuff of a changed life. This is why when somebody says, well, there, there isn't going to be any real change, like immediately, you don't understand salvation. There'll be things that you'll struggle with for years, probably. Only because God hasn't cut that out of your life yet. The problem of you giving things up is that God didn't point his finger at it. And just like how you can hear something, and though it may be the truth, if man revealed it unto you, you're not going to receive it. But if God reveals that thing to you, you can't hardly deny the thing. And if you're able to, you receive that with gladness. And though it may be the truth, if it didn't come from God, it's not good for you. Because it's just putting more whitewash on that wall on that whited sepulcher. But in relation to the sins in our life, the fruit of our sin nature, smoking, drinking, wicked music, fornicating, well, I mean, you just list the whole thing out, your pride, your bitterness, your anger, your hatred toward your husband, your hatred toward your wife, I mean, whatever it may be. If you give something up before God takes it from you, it's the same exact thing. It, it's a good thing for you to give that thing up, to get rid of it. But not before God says it's time. That's why it wouldn't bother me now to see people smoking in our parking lot. Do you know why? Because probably 20 minutes earlier they were sitting in preaching of the, chur the church, and hearing the preaching of the Word of God, and having the Word of God falling on their ears, and they're seeking Him earnestly. Am I sad for them? Absolutely. But would it bother me? Not a bit. Would it bother me to have somebody sitting in our pews, right in the front row, smelling like alcohol, still a little bit of slurred speech? It would make me sad. If I needed to talk a little bit slower so they could understand me because they were still a little hungover from the night before, glory to God, they're in the house of God. Jesus had to really stir some things up in order to get the temple ready for the halt and the blind and the maimed. Hmm. Well, I think we're going to close out chapter 7 with that. Um, as we get into chapter 8, th there, is a, there is a bit of a shift. And it, it's, it's a little subtle, but there is a bit of a shift. So study that out. See what you can find. Be prepared for next week, and, and we'll, we'll see what the Lord brings to us. Um, Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this night. And Lord God, I thank you for the word of God. Uh, Lord, thank you that we're able to receive from you. Uh, Lord, thank you for the, uh, the sorrow that it works in us. Lord, help us as we seek you. Uh, Lord, as your saints, as we, as we seek to know you more. Lord, as the lost who are here tonight, oh God, I pray that you be merciful on them as they seek you. Uh, Lord, show them your great grace. Lord, what a great, um, amazing grace it is that you brought them into the house of God twice today. All oh, glory to God for that. Now, Father, I pray that you would take these things that we've heard, Lord, and that you'd guard them against the wicked one. Oh, Lord, I pray that Satan wouldn't come and snatch that seed away. Uh, Father, help us to, to uh, see that fallow ground that needs broken up. And Lord, give us the wherewithal to do that. Father, may we take the charge to cleanse our hands, O ye sinners, and purify our hearts, all ye double-minded. Repent, mourn, weep. Let your joy be turned into sorrow. God, because that godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Lord, help us to grab hold of this truth tonight. I pray that Jesus was magnified. And I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ was extolled above all today. And Lord, take these things and use them for your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.